But when you pull out your sample and you have the tip end and then you have the cut end, you want to take it and you want to ping it by your ear. I just don't know what to spin first. Hello everyone, how are you today? I hope you're having a really good day so far. If you're new here, my name is Taylor. I live in Baltimore City and on my YouTube channel, I feature content that's generally focused on knitting and spinning. I'm really excited to sit down and share with you guys a lot of things that I have to talk about today. Um, to rattle them off the top, we have Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival coming up next weekend. It is the biggest day of the year because I do live in the state of Maryland. It is very easy for me to get to the largest sheep and wool festival on the east coast of the United States. And if you are a hand spinner, you might know that it is probably one of the biggest fleece sales, I would guess, in the country. I, I don't, I can't say that for a fact, but I think it might be true. And I'm really, really excited for that. It is right around the corner and I almost forgot. Like I, I, it, I haven't really been anticipating it um, as much as I typically do because I've had many distractions the last week or so. You might already know if you are a subscriber here of my channel. I posted on my community tab last week that I couldn't record my other cat. This is Star Baby Moonchild. I have two other cats. Scab, our middle child, she got out, was lost for about five or six days and is back home now. Thank goodness. Um, that is a longer story I will share towards the end of today's video. Um, lots of drama, but I want to talk today about buying raw fleece because that is something some of you watching might anticipate doing at this upcoming Sheep and Wool Festival or sometime in the future, or maybe never. And I have project updates. Of course, I'm currently wearing my newest finished object, which is what I'm calling the Kingston cardigan. I'm really excited that this pattern is going to be published in 12 sizes. The finished measurements are 37 to 70 inches wide in the chest or bust. And you know, that would fit anyone from 30 inches to about 60 inches with seven to 10 inches of ease. This project is worked from the top down flat with raglan shoulder shaping and a deep yoke design. There are rapid decreases to give a bit of a I don't know if you would, it's certainly not a dolman sleeve. It's like a mild case of the dolman. It is knit with Jill Draper Make Stuff Kingston yarn, hence the name. And it is worked from the top down flat with raglan shoulder shaping and a very simple two by two cable that is mirrored. I can layer long sleeve shirts, like long sleeve button up shirts or any kind of like long sleeve shirt, even um, another sweater. I can easily layer under this because it's nice and deep in the yoke and there's room for that extra fabric, um, both in the chest and the upper arm area. Um, because of the deep yoke, the sleeves are nice and wide at the bicep. So I was sure to grade the sizes um, so that larger sizes have a generous upper arm because I know proportionally um, that is more appropriate, I think, than um, what some standard measures give. I was listening to a Patty Lyons podcast with Fatima. Uh, her handle on Instagram is disturbing the fleece. I know some of you out there really enjoy her Wednesday lives. Side note, I, I cannot do Instagram at work. Like live videos on Instagram at work cannot work for me because I answer the phones and I have to tear out my earbud. And when I tear out my earbud, it still plays on my phone and I can't turn it off fast enough. I wish I could view Instagram lives during the day, but anyway. Yes, uh, both of them were talking about how the kind of standard measure for the bicep is not quite what it should be for larger sizes. And I filed that in the back of my mind while drafting this pattern. So if you're interested in testing and supporting me here and putting this pattern out into the world, I will 
um, leave that link below for you to fill out and I will follow up soon with um, with more info. Sorry, I have cat hair all over my face. I have to stop and take my antibiotic. I will be right back. I'm just gonna get into this right now. This is the pill that I have to swallow twice a day for 10 days uh, because my cat bit the shit out of me. Oh, if you were wondering, these are some vintage buttons that I purchased on Etsy some time ago. What is going on with Etsy? Are we, are we boycotting Etsy? Are we protesting Etsy? I don't know the details. I have a friend or two that sell on Etsy and I haven't thought to go out of my way to ask if they're, uh, what their thoughts are on that. Um, but yeah, I heard there's some Etsy drama I haven't really gotten into. Aside from the Kingston Cardi, I have been working on a new cast on. Um, this is one of my favorite project bags. This is one that I made with vintage fabric that I found at the thrift store. I'm obsessed with it. The inner lining is also vintage. It's a former pillowcase. I'm holding within it some of my West wool. I've shared this in a recent video. And this is the beginning front right side of what is Stephen West's bobble shawl. So you begin with this I-cord here and it kind of rests across the shoulders in a drop sleeve structure. And then you work into that I-cord for each of the fronts and the back. And then eventually I'm sure I will join those two. And the thing is entirely worked flat. Some choose to steak it so that it's worked in the round the whole way. Um, and I think because I just got done working this flat, I'm not opposed to continuing the process of working this project flat. I might change my mind once the shaping is done, which isn't very aggressive. And actually I'm planning to modify, not because I feel like it's necessary, but because I made an error. <laughs> and a lot of the times when I make a mistake, I just decide, well, I will make that mistake on both sides and I will adapt and it'll be slightly different, which means I am very likely going to have a deeper yoke than planned. Um, I think it won't be more than six bubble rows, which is like already about as many as I've worked, about that many. So we're talking about increasing the yoke at most, maybe three to four inches. I'm just guessing numbers here. And in my mind, that just kind of speaks to how I generally like things to fit. What I'm trying to say is that with this simple modification that grew from a mistake, I'm guaranteeing that the upper arm will not sit too close to my armpit. As you know, I do not enjoy. And I will have a nice deep yoke that accommodates the width of my shoulders and will give a nice relaxed fit. And I am anticipating then I would have to perform more rapid decreases or additional decreases to the arm circumference as those are worked. Um, I've done that many times before, so I'm not anxious about doing so while working in pattern. It's just more likely that I might have some kind of seam that isn't in the written design if he doesn't incorporate decreases into the arms of this pattern, um, which I haven't looked forward enough to know for sure. The majority of this pattern is worked with West Wool's bicycle yarn. It's their fingering weight base. It's very soft. Um, and it has a bit of a halo to it, which I really like. It kind of has a feel uh, when working it similar to Superwash, like it's really slinky. It's very um, just like slippery, like it's very, it has little friction. I don't believe it's a Superwash yarn, um, but it, it, I feel like if you were to combine the two in a project together, they would marry each other well. Um, Yes, so main color is black. I think they call that Copenhagen. I might be mistaken, um, but the 
button band, the cuffs, and the bottom band are going to be that pure black color. And then I chose a dark hunter green, this avocado green, um, this mustardy yellow here, and this kind of Dijon yellow. Um, this is the tiger colorway. These are all West Wool Bicycle Yarn. And then the kind of chartreuse green here and the muddy kind of brownish olivey tone color. Those are both Brooklyn Tweeds Loft Yarn. So I'm mixing bases that are both worsted spun and woolen spun. Um, and then the final color, this kind of bright red orange is the Biche and Bouche uh, Le Petit Lamb's Wool. Uh, so it is a woolen spun two ply jumper weight sort of yarn. It is a bit thinner than the rest, but I feel like, um, you know, they, they all work together quite well. They're not too far off from one another that there's any noticeable difference in the gauge. This project was deeply inspired by the colors of this bag. And I originally knit a swatch um, that I didn't quite block, but the count came out well. I actually started with the suggested needle size in the first three bubble rows, which is a size five. And then I went down to a size four because I felt like the fabric was just coming out a little too loose. I didn't like the way it kind of felt in my hands. And I thought if it were just tightened up a tiny bit, the stitches would have more definition and they would just rest better, which I don't know if you can tell, but um, the first three green rows, those are fives. And then at the mid row of the yellow color, I switched to fours and I worked the rest of my swatch in size four. Originally, I was going to use a totally different red for this project. I purchased um, kind of this brickish red color from West Wool uh, that as soon as I started, I was immediately turned off by it. It just didn't fit the project the way I intended. As I said, it's inspired by this project bag, which has no red in it. It's very much orange. And I I just realized that, that that color I chose wasn't at all what it should have been. So I scrapped it and pulled from a different project I had planned. I used these little stitch markers to note every 10 stitches so that I wouldn't have to count the same stitches a gazillion times. I just feel like it has this kind of trippy, retro, vintage vibe. We're going to transition into our fleece talk. I store all my fleeces in these sort of vintage pillowcases and the benefit to that is the fabric breathes really well. So you're not trapping any unwanted moisture with the fibers that could lead to yeast or mold growth. This is fiber that I didn't wash properly and so it's a little bit sticky with lanolin still. And the thing about lanolin is you really want to remove as much of it as possible. Otherwise it will re-solidify. And then the process of handling the fiber is never quite easy. Now this is quite a short staple for a Cormo fleece. Um, this is more of a standard staple for, I would say a Merino fleece. I would guess this is about three inches. Me, personally, this is the minimum staple length I want to hand process. I'm not going to enjoy myself hand combing a fiber shorter than this. Um, if I were carding it, that might be a different story. I do prefer to hand comb my fleeces on my Valkyrie Extra Fine hand combs. And um, anything shorter than three inches is just a little too difficult to grip onto and draft. Um, this particular bit of fiber, I think, is um, accidentally pulled from an area of the fleece that is maybe a little bit of a shorter staple than other parts of it. Um, this is a fleece I purchased at Rhinebeck uh, a few years ago. I have hand spun a garment from this already. This is what I have left over. Um, and you'll see, like, you know, once you remove the felted tips, it does remove a little bit of the stable length. So when you're choosing a fleece, get an idea of the stable length, number one, and think about how you intend to process it. Like I said, if you're hand combing, the longer the staple, 
the easier carding it's the opposite the longer the staple the more difficult it might actually be to card that fiber um, this being a natural colored fleece there's some variegation to the coloring you'll see that there's some areas that are kind of bleached by the sun the tips are a little felted from the coat that it wore but there might have been some point in time where it was exposed to sun i think a lot of the times animals will wear, will wear coats when they're eating hay like over winter but if they're out grazing in the grass where they're not up against so much dry vegetable matter they might remove the coat um, for the comfort of the animal um, if animals are sweating the mixture of their sweat and the lanolin and any shedding of the skin cells can create what is called skirt no scruff something there's something i forget what it is um Ugh, it's a nightmare. You never want to buy a fleece that looks like it has dander in it because there's absolutely no way you will ever wash it out. I have made the mistake before. If you look all the way back to the very first video I've ever uploaded on YouTube, it's me devastated over a fleece that I purchased at Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool that had tons of this junk in it. It was a disaster. The next thing I learned is buy a longer staple length. Now, one of the reasons why Cormo fleeces are coveted by us hand spinners is that they are a breed of sheep that is a merino, which has that very fine fiber with a very dense and, and high crimp, which makes it very bouncy and hold lots of air the combination of those qualities with a long wool sheep, which gives a greater staple. Um, Cormo is actually a cross between a Corridale and a Merino, and a Corridale is a cross between a Merino and I think I, it might be the Leicester long wool breed. Um, you can learn a lot about breed specific fiber and yarn in this source book, the fleece and fiber source book. This is the Bible of hand spinners, hands down. There's just unending knowledge in this source book here. There's chapters on the English long wool family. I think every sheep breed imaginable is almost listed in this book. I believe it sorts it by like fine, medium, yada yada it might go regionally it's been a long time since i've deeply looked into this because i haven't been spinning much lately but um highly highly recommend this book it is an inexhaustible resource on all things wool and fleece and fiber when you're purchasing a fleece find that sample like i said gently pull it away from the rest from the tip and take a look at it now here I have ends that are a little tippy, meaning they're a little bit felted. And if I tug on them, I might break the yarn a little bit to remove that felted fiber. So I've, I've removed that felted tip to the end and I'm gonna kind of tug at the cut end. You can see here a little bit of a second cut there I'm gonna remove. And here we have a really nice and long staple. This is a natural chocolate Cormo fleece. So you can see I have about an extra inch or so of staple length on this fiber. That extra inch is really gonna go a long way in making this fiber easier to hand spin and comb. Uh, this fiber in particular has a little bit of variegation to its natural coloring. You can see it's a very deep and gorgeous chocolate brown with some bleaching of the tips. Here I have a small skein of yarn that I've spun into a two-ply from this fiber that I hand combed. Um, but something else that you can do for a more uniform color of a natural fleece like this one when it has such a long staple length, you can um, 
gently trim away the ends that are tippy or bleached and work with a slightly shorter staple that's more uniform in color. I would basically load my hand comb with the fiber and then gently, I say gently, I don't know why, but you know, gingerly trim away the, the ends that are a little bit felted and a little bit sun bleached. I found that the yarn was more bouncy. It had more um, sturdiness to it. I think that it probably would felt a lot less if the ends of the fiber are not broken by ripping them apart, by pinching off and tearing away the, the felted tips to it. This fiber, it seems I very successfully washed clean. It doesn't have a lot of the stickiness um, of that residual lanolin that I have here in this fleece. Um, I really did make a mistake in not washing this fleece well enough, and that had made it a bit of a nightmare to process. I think that I've been holding on to this last bit of it, thinking that maybe I'll try rewashing it again. I don't know. If you have any advice for me out there, let me know in a comment below. Moving away from fine wool, I have what was the New York State Sheep and Wool first place mohair fleece, which is, I guess not technically fleece. I think it's hair, but it is this gorgeous silvery blonde gray natural mohair fleece. I don't even know what I'm going to do with it, but it is just lock after lock of gorgeousness. Here I have my second dark fleece. This one is a little different than the other. It is of a shorter staple. I think that this might actually be um, a merino fleece. Um, I hadn't washed this one as well as that other. The thing is, merino fleeces are notoriously difficult to wash well enough. The lanolin is just in between every single fine fiber and when you have such a high crimp like that it's very difficult to remove. Um, I hate myself sometimes for not putting in the extra effort of rinsing it all out because it really really does make it difficult for me to process. I think maybe if I apply a little bit of oil to the fiber as I comb it it might kind of make it more slippery and less sticky. I'm gonna try that out maybe. Let me know what your thoughts are if you have more experience than I do in this regard. Um, but this is a shorter staple and a far more consistent fleece. I mean, it's almost the same color throughout the entire fleece here. Um, I mean, if you can look into this bag. It almost looks pure black. Because this fleece is so darn clean of vegetable matter and any felting or to the tips, it's very much almost ready to spin. I could very likely simply comb or actually use my hand carders to gently card the tips of the fiber open and potentially spin straight from the from the, the fleece. I have another natural, this is a gray fleece. Um, gray fleeces are more difficult to find with consistent coloring. It'll have one shade of gray to one end and then another shade of gray from the bleaching of the sun and then additional shades of gray throughout different portions of the fleece. So maybe one end of the sheep will be one color gray, another end of the sheep will be a different color gray, and there's some inconsistency in the coloring. Also, there can be variation in the texture of the fleece depending on where the fiber is grown on the animal. This is like a cloud, it's like a pillow of fiber. I mean, so, so dense. It does still have some lanolin in it, but not enough that it feels like it's glued together. It does have a little bit of that lanolin smell to it. It's like this sickeningly sweet smell. 
Uh, once all the, the urine and the feces are washed away, it doesn't have that stinky sheep smell. It, it, lanolin has its own fragrance. But this is fiber that I combed out the tips and the cut end. So I opened up the fibers to have a lot of flow to get all the lanolin between them out. I think that previously I had only really flicked open the ends of the tips and not the cut end as well. This time around I flicked both ends to really wash out the lanolin from these densely packed fibers. And I have here a very large and gorgeous fleece of nearly pure white wool. This is a Cormo wool, so the staple length is nice and long. There are some bits that I can feel are a little bit more sticky with lanolin than others. But I think that once I process this and then I have it spun, I will give it a warm bath with wool wash to really remove any residual um, oils to it uh, before knitting so that it won't have such a stank to it. This is just one of the most perfect fleeces I've ever processed. It's got a gorgeous long staple length. It has very fine uniform fibers. Um, I somewhat successfully removed much of the lanolin. So I'm, I think that I'm really going to dedicate some time to processing this. I'm going to weed out some of the wool. I might just never ever rehab after my failed attempt to scouring. Um, and I might make room to bring home a new fleece this year. I, I think that I've brought home a fleece from Maryland and Rhinebeck my last two trips and not even touched them. So I really need to put a fair bit of thought into what I bring home if anything, because I have run out of space and I do have far more than I probably need. And given the amount of time that I've devoted to hand spinning the last two years, I really don't know that I deserve to bring more home. But, um, you know, when you love fiber as much as I do, it's hard to resist sometimes. Um, the last thing that I brought home, and this was from Rhinebeck, is this gorgeous Gotland fleece. Now this is very, very similar to the mohair, but it's this gorgeous dark gray, very uniform in color throughout. And it has these just gorgeous ringlets I cannot get enough of. I, I did wash this. Did I? I don't know if I did. I think I have. I think I did just a cold soak. Um, long wool breeds like this, they don't have nearly the amount of lanolin, if any, hardly, um, that the fine wools do. So you can just simply cold soak and rinse um, longer wool sheets like these. Um, it doesn't smell like it did when I brought it home. It, this is a yearling fleece. I mean, it, it smelled very much like a baby, <laughs> this weird yeasty quality to it. Um, but it just has this gorgeous, gorgeous sheen. And I don't know if my camera will pick up how shiny and bright this fiber is. I just don't know what to spin first. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Um, so when you're choosing a fleece, you want to make sure that you're purchasing one with a sound structure to the fiber. There are times when um, in the process of growing a fleece that there might be a break in the fiber. Like if the if the ewe is pregnant and the stress of pregnancy is too much for the animal, the first place that the animal's body might kind of diverge energy away from in order to produce a healthier lamb would be in the fleece. So the fleece quality can be impacted by stressors like pregnancy or maybe weather, diet, all kinds of things. 
you want to make sure that you're choosing a fleece that is sound and does not have breaks. Sometimes you can visibly see breaks. Of course, I don't have an example of a fleece with a break in it because I've consciously chose not to buy them, although I have come across them before and it's not uncommon, although very often people are not trying to put that out there on the market. So you won't see it a lot of the time, but you might find a really nice looking fleece and then realize there's a break in it somewhere. To avoid purchasing a fleece with a break in it, you want to pull out a sample very carefully from the fleece. You might already find one laying on top of it because someone might have already done this before. You do want to try to minimize the tugging of it as much as possible, just out of respect for the shepherd um, and the future buyer. We do want to process these fleeces a lot of the time as intact as possible. It allows you to lay the fleece out um, and really get a sense of which end is the back end, which end is the front end, which parts of it are the sides and which are the middle, because each area of the fleece offers a different quality of fiber. And there's different things to kind of pull out from different areas, like around the side body, um, on the outer edges, you might pull away those bits of the fleece to remove areas that are kind of caked in dirt from laying down or even like urine along the back end. There can be a lot of urine or feces to remove along the front neck. There might be a lot of hay or chaff kind of stuck in um, the fibers in that area if they've been grazing on, you know, hay over winter or whatever it might be. But when you pull out your sample and you have the tip end and then you have the cut end, you want to take it and you want to ping it by your ear. And you hear that sound. And if there's any crackling, if there's any crackling to that sound, then the fibers are breaking and they will be more prone to pilling. They will be less strong of a fiber for spinning and you might avoid buying that fleece. When I found Scab who was lost for five or six days, um, well, she got out on Friday, so she was out Friday, and we didn't find her until Wednesday night. Um, I called out her name, and she called me back, and she was right on the other side of our fence in our neighbor's yard, and I quickly climbed the fence. I scooped her up. I said, Brian, I'm going to hand her to you, and he says, no, just take her through the gate, and I'm like, no, I'm going to hand her to you, and he was walking away from me to open the gate and I attempted to start towards the gate, but I was like, this is not gonna work. She's running out of my arms. I lose control of her. I don't let go. She squirms out of my grasp. I still have her by the tail, which was a huge mistake. I should have let her go, but I was afraid. I just got her. I just found her. I was so afraid of losing her and she bit me. She bit me pretty bad. I mean, she got my palm. She got my pinky two times. My arm is all scratched up. And I have a pretty big bite on my thigh with a nice large bruise and welt. Four puncture wounds there. So I'm on Augmentin for 10 days. It's a heavy antibiotic. It's like a horse pill. And my hand's finally feeling better. It, it was definitely, I mean, I, I went to urgent care within a half hour of the bite. Um, and started antibiotics that evening. Um, if you don't know, cat bites are very serious. You should always go straight to the doctor, start antibiotics. Cat mouths are very dirty, but also puncture wounds are the most um, dangerous of wounds because you can't possibly clean anything out of them, uh, given the fact that they're just so deep into the skin. And then on top of that, when it's a puncture wound to the hand, there's so much connective tissue crossing in multiple areas that after it's punctured, those tissues close so rapidly, you can't possibly clean beneath connective tissue well enough to not avoid infection. So it really took a lot out of me this week. Like I said, that happened Wednesday night. So I've been kind of recovering since then. Thursday was a little rough. Friday still 
Today I'm feeling much better. I might put my wedding ring and band, uh, my, my wedding rings back on because they were like, you need to take them off. If your hand swells, you'll be back and we'll have to cut them off. So, um, I've never taken them off before. Anyway, I, I feel like I'm on the mend. And of course it's because of the antibiotics and I hope that they will do all they need and things will be fine once that course is through. I am, I was very, very angry that it all went down this way because, um, I do live with an autoimmune condition. I have autoimmune arthritis and I manage that with diet and exercise to maintain a healthy microbiome to prevent the consequences of um, a flare up due to the molecular mimicry of that permeable membrane of my gut. So I just said a lot there. I don't know if it means anything to you, but essentially um, taking antibiotics is very um, difficult for me because it disrupts the whole microbiome of my system. I have a very hyper permeable um, gut lining. Um, it's something that I've struggled with my whole life. And um, because of that, molecules that will pass through it that maybe they wouldn't in other people, um, but they do in my body. Uh, my body notices them, sees that they're very similar to my actual connective tissue. And then in fighting those molecules that pass through and shouldn't be there, my body also battles its own tissues that connect my ligaments to my bones. And so I am experiencing more inflammation than I typically do because that seems to be occurring and um, it's very uncomfortable. Um, so far, I haven't reached the stage of my flare up where walking is difficult or um, laying down is difficult, but you might experience this too. It can be difficult to get into bed at night, to be comfortable laying, sitting, standing, walking at the late hours of the day and the early hours of the morning. Um, something that does help is movement and exercise. It feels counterintuitive because it's so uncomfortable to move and live and, and it's, I mean, to just exist feels exhausting, but to, 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 um, commit time and energy to movement is, is, it's like a homeopathic remedy. It's like the thing that you would never think to do is the thing that is best for me. So I'm planning to get out on my skates today while editing this video. That's one thing I really like doing is I'll um, put in my earbuds or my headphones and I will edit my video while I just skate mindlessly around the Lake Montebello here in Baltimore. And without knowing it, I will skate an hour, sometimes an hour and 45 minutes without even thinking about how long I've been out there. And um, I don't typically skate that long. It's usually like 20 to 45 minutes at a time. But um, the action of my hips and my spine working in a functional range of movement, you know, something that I, you know, walking, skating is like low impact walking almost. Um, it's just very stabilizing to the major muscle groups around my joints to keep them as healthy as they can be given the circumstances. Um, so I do need to do that. Are you watching the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard civil trial happening right now? Oh my goodness. I was a little starved for entertainment lately. I've, I've quit watching a podcast I used to be a member of. Um, I won't go into why, it's not even relevant to this community at all, but I just, I used to watch their channel like nine hours a week. And now that I'm just kind of turned off by it all, I found the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial to watch while I'm at work. And it is fascinating. I cannot imagine, I mean, I can't imagine, but I mean, I just, I didn't know 
I had no idea. I've watched every single day of trial so far and I do enjoy most Emily D. Baker's commentary on the trial, uh, which is live, um, because I love watching her and I love watching the whole process. Uh, she hasn't been able to stream every single day of it, but I have watched every single day of this trial so far, and I'm just completely captivated by it. I watch a lot of true crime. I'm just really fascinated by the drama. Um, and you know, it, it's not that it's interesting because these are rich and wealthy people, but it's kind of nice to see um, the grimy details. I very much do like to see the facade torn down <laughs> in a way because um, it's just a lot more real than this image people portray and I like I like the real. At this point right now it doesn't even matter I think what the courts come to a decision regarding because it's clear at this point that the court of public opinion is very much siding along with Johnny Depp in this case. I can say and I hope I don't upset anybody by saying this it's just my opinion you're welcome to have your own opinion um, but I very much am siding with him on this case to me it's and of course this is a case brought to the courts by Johnny Depp he and his very good lawyers are presenting their case right now Amber Heard hasn't given her testimony yet in this case but I think given what we know right now it probably won't even do much for her at this point um I'm just kind of blown away by it all. I'm obsessed. I mean, even when trial isn't happening, I watch commentary on the trial on Fridays when uh, the court is seeing other cases or even on the weekends between tasks, I'll listen to what someone has to say about it. I'm just totally obsessed with this drama. And I think that I'm going to do a Johnny Depp deep dive. There's a lot of movies he's been in I never thought to watch and some that are really appealing. Um, and I feel like I'm like more of a fan of his than I ever was before. Not to say he's a perfect person. I think though, I mean, we very, we too often equate uh, substance abuse issues with being a horrible person. Anyway, I digress. Um, but if you're watching the trial too, and you're enjoying it also, let me know in a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. And I think that that's going to be it for this episode of the Thread to Men podcast. I want to thank you so much for watching. If you want to find me on social media, my name's Taylor E. Owen on Ravelry, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget, if you're interested in test knitting the Kingston cardigan, you can submit the forum in the link below. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day and that you take care.